Our planet is surrounded by water, not just on its surface, but throughout its atmosphere. Water vapor rises to form the aerial reservoirs we call clouds, destined to fall again as rain. This is an endless cycle that circulates fresh water between lakes and seas and sky. Early explorers came across one body of water so vast they were convinced it must be a new sea. But it was in fact a lake, Lake Tanganyika in Africa. It's a very ancient lake, fed by huge volumes of fresh river water. Water not only quenches the thirst of plants and animals, it carries nutrients into the soil, feeding vegetation. Drenched in moisture, the lake region is a paradise for plants and animals. This lake is as deep as an ocean, over 1,300 meters in places. Its depths are bleak with virtually no nutrients and no life. But as in the oceans, where light penetrates the upper layers of water, the lake is very much alive. River otters mingle with more kinds of fish than there are in all of Europe. And this spot-necked otter is after a particularly intriguing one. It's a puffer fish, and its brilliant defence is working. The otter loses interest. Puffer fish are usually found in the sea. This is a freshwater cousin of the many saltwater species. The motionless football of a fish wasn't much fun, and the otter's still in the mood for a game. Turtle chasing will do fine. And a friend soon joins in. This is not a good day to be a turtle. Wrong place at the wrong time again. It's wandered into the territory of a yellow coolie. Lake Tanganyika is the setting for an unusual fish story. The lake is filled with more than 200 species of fish, all evolved from one unremarkable ancestor, carried here by a river. These fish are all cichlids, and they all evolved here in the lake. Cichlids adapted to fill every niche the lake has to offer. Some have jaws so flexible they can suck algae off rocks. Others pick at their greens. There are now so many different cichlid species and in such numbers that they keep this vast body of water clear of the plant debris that clouds most lakes. 
It's so clear the otters have no chance of making a sneak attack. So they work together as a rapid strike force. Powerful feet, sharp claws and, of course, good teamwork means that otters are among the few animals that can catch cichlids. The lake is home to the only freshwater sardines in the world. In fact, they're unrelated to marine sardines, but have evolved to fill a similar niche. Cichlids are not found anywhere else on Earth, but they are very successful colonizers of this lake. However, just because they all come from the same ancestor doesn't mean they don't compete with each other. They stake and defend territories. Some cichlids even form gangs and go on the rampage against other species. Black cichlids look after their newly hatched young in craters they dig from the sandy lake bottom. But whole clutches may be lost to the passing mob. A successful parent will defend its young and maybe about one in 10,000 will make it to adulthood, which is good for a cichlid. Lake Tanganyika is so large that it creates its own weather system. Storms are localized but can turn violent. Cyclones suck the lake into the sky inside towering water spouts. In Central Africa's tropical warmth, the waters of life are continually recycled. Water is essential to life, but life adapts, even to the very driest conditions. Deserts appear devoid of water. But animals will colonize any environment, adapting to the harshest conditions, as long as there's some water somewhere. This is the Kalahari Desert in Southern Africa. It hardly seems possible, but wildlife survives even here, where the only visible body of water is a mirage. Small insects, like termites, are mobile sacks of water and protein for other animals, like barking geckos. The desert can also support large colonies. Weaver birds build elaborate nest communities. They're lucky. They can fly to distant pools to find their water. The desert can even sustain mammals, small and large. Springbok browse at its scrubby margins, and so do their predators, lions. Like all of the large desert animals, the lion gets its moisture almost entirely from its food. All of these animals are perfectly at home in a place so dry a human being couldn't last much more than a day. Although we think of them as permanently dry, many deserts do get a short deluge of rain at least once a year.
It may only be a brief respite from the drought, but every plant and animal is programmed to respond instantly to the arrival of water. The hard-baked soil reveals one form of life that has been waiting a long time for this moment. Bullfrogs buried themselves at the end of the last rains, lying dormant for nearly a year. The new rains soak the dry earth, reviving the slumbering frogs, and they emerge ready to mate. They can only breed while the surface water lasts, while there are freshwater pools in which their young can feed and grow. For a short time, the desert is transformed. Many insects and plants rush to complete their life cycles. In only a few weeks, the ground will be parched once again. For now, the desert is a riot of colour and life. But one region of the Kalahari is wet year-round. the Okavango Delta. Thousands of years ago, a massive earthquake diverted the flow of the Okavango River, turning it inland and creating a marsh in the middle of a desert. Like Lake Tanganyika, this watery world is a rich one. Much of the water is shallow, creating vast marshlands. These conditions are ideal for wading birds, like storks, herons and cranes. This is the largest wetland in the world. When the annual rains top up the delta, it sprawls across more than 15,000 square kilometres. In most parts of the world, rain does arrive, eventually. But some animals don't just sit and wait. They travel hundreds of kilometres to be in the right place at the right time. Every year, vast herds of wildebeest make an annual 2,400-kilometre round trip, chasing the waters of life. In the spring, they migrate across Africa's Serengeti plains. At this time of year, the grass has dried out in the southern plains. The wildebeest somehow sense that it's time to move north, toward the coming rains and the lush new grass they will produce. There is a terrible obstacle in their path, the Grometi River. This river is home to freshwater crocodiles. They are the largest in the world. Some are six metres long, and they live here for a good reason, a regular supply of meat. Thirst forces the wildebeest to the river's edge. They must drink.
seized by a two-ton crocodile, a 200-kilogram wildebeest stands little chance of escape. The wildebeest see their opportunity. Thousands live to complete the journey, and they and their descendants repeat it again and again. Wherever there is fresh water, you will find wildlife. Animals of all shapes and sizes drink, feed, swim and breed in it. In Uganda, elephants and hippos gather in and around the great Kazinga Channel that connects Lake George and Lake Edward. The daily presence of these large, water-loving mammals has an extraordinary effect. Their dung often goes straight into the water. The dung fertilizes the lake and supports the larvae of a creature that is minute compared to the elephants and hippos, but vastly outnumbers them. Clouds of lake flies. Early explorers saw the clouds from a distance and thought the lake was on fire. The flies are tiny, the size of mosquitoes, but at the beginning of the rainy season they swarm in billions. The flies hatch en masse creating a seasonal bonanza for birds. Fish follow the rising larvae to the lake surface, so this is also the time of year fishermen can make their best catches. Ultimately, no lake, river or marsh exists without the presence of one miraculous substance. Water. Some places receive so much rain that water courses over every surface. There is enough rain to soak the ground and plenty left over. This is the rainforest of Brazil, one of the wettest places on Earth. So much rain falls in the wet season that the Amazon River and its tributaries swell into raging torrents. The Amazon basin fills with water, but the rivers cannot carry it out to the sea quickly enough. The rivers rise and rise, and the rainforest undergoes a complete transformation. The forest floor has disappeared, 
and the flooding will last for five months. The wildlife of this extraordinary forest takes this in its stride and adjusts to an entirely different world. There's only one way for a hungry three-toed sloth to get from tree to tree. Sloth, this is a hard time of year. It's considerably easier for the fish. Large arowana fish have the freedom of the forest in their search for food, below and above the water. Boundaries are blurred. Hatchet fish are naturally at home in the water, but they have an astonishing defence when they're under threat. Vertical takeoff and landing helps keep the hatchet fish out of harm, but not all fish are so lucky. And not all predators are so easy to see. The Amazon leaf fish has an excellent disguise for a flooded forest floor. The fish are used to swimming in and around fallen leaves, so the leaf fish can sneak up on its prey unnoticed and it can also hide from its own predators. The fishing birds of the Amazon basin are spoiled for choice. There are more than 2,000 different species of freshwater fish here. There are only 300 in all of Europe. The diversity of fish is astonishing in one of evolution's prime laboratories. In this wet, tropical forest, some kind of fresh fruit is available all year round. Tree-dwelling primates, like the wakaris, may be stuck in the trees when the Amazon floods, but they have plenty to eat. Fruit trees have several means of dispersing their seeds. Monkeys and birds carry some off. Many will fall into the water. In most places, birds, mammals and even insects transport seeds. But here, fish take on the role, carrying seeds they have eaten throughout the flooded forest. Large seeds need the services of large distributors. The paku is a giant relative of the piranha. It can crack even the hardest nutshells. Its teeth are more like those of a horse than a fish. The people of the Amazon depend on its fish, but at this time of year they can be hard to find. Freshwater dolphins are also hunting for fish. Boto River dolphins are unusual, the world's only freshwater dolphin. But like their marine cousins, they are expert echolocators. They emit sounds that help them see their quarry in the murky water. This fisherman has no such built-in sonar. 
How is he to know where to set his nets in all this water? There is no obvious river anymore and no banks to funnel the fish together. So almost any place will do. As long as there are dolphins nearby. The dolphins herd fish ahead of them. And some of the fish find themselves trapped in the nets. Dolphins take a few of the fish for themselves, but there are plenty for both man and dolphin alike. The Amazon and its tributaries form the largest drainage basin on the planet. All rivers are torrents of liquid energy, heading relentlessly downhill towards the sea. Small rivers join forces with larger rivers. Water is a life-giving force, but a fast-flowing river attacks the land, sculpting cliffs and valleys, washing away soil. Most living things have no choice but to go with the flow. Once a year, salmon struggle against it on their way to the streams in which they were born. In North America, they also have to get past grizzly bears. All the bears have to do is be in the right place at the right time. But they have made their own long migrations, crossing hundreds of kilometers to reach this spot. Here, they know the river will bring them a much-needed pre-winter feast. Fully grown salmon is a substantial source of protein for a bear. If it survives, a salmon's life is just one long round trip.
The salmon struggle is repeated in hundreds of rivers worldwide. Whether it's through the North Pacific or the English Channel, breeding salmon know when it's time to head home. The fish use their instinct and their sense of smell to find their way to the river where they were spawned. They lay their eggs in the shallower waters. The odds against completing the trip and successfully spawning a new generation are incredibly high. The adult salmon go no further. They die here, where they were born. Up to five metres of rain can fall here in a year, and the American Dipper knows how to make the most of this watery world. It has an uncanny ability to catch its prey beneath the surface of the cold mountain streams. The Dipper has a special layer of insulating underfeathers, and its eyes have an extra transparent membrane that allows it to see clearly underwater, like a diver with goggles. For a tiny bird, this is most unusual behaviour. Dippers make their homes in a perpetual torrent, even building their nests just behind the rushing water. They have a limitless supply of nest building material, spongy moss, which the dippers shape into large domed shelters for their young. Water is so commonplace that it's easy to forget how beautiful and unusual it actually is. Water transforms the land, and it too is transformed, turning solid with a drop in temperature. Only one quarter of all the fresh water on Earth exists as an accessible liquid. The remaining water is locked up for at least part of the year. Water in any form is a potent force. Come spring, blankets of snow are transformed back into liquid. At the poles, the Arctic and Antarctic ice caps hold three quarters of the planet's fresh water in long-term cold storage. 
floating sea ice is actually frozen seawater. Icebergs are a different form of ice entirely. They are made of freshwater ice, formed when large lumps of glaciers break loose where they reach the sea. Even in its frozen form, water supports life. Polar bears are strong swimmers, but they spend most of their time roaming the Arctic ice. Living in or on water, they are classed not as land animals, but marine mammals. They're perfectly adapted to this bleak white world. Polar bears range as far south as the edge of the Arctic ice shelf, using the ice as a vast diving platform from which they hunt for seals. Their sparkling snowsuits help them disappear, making it easier to catch their prey. The bears share their ice-bound world with a scavenger dressed in winter white, the Arctic fox. The foxes are also Arctic hunters, but will happily scavenge on food left behind by the bears. A female polar bear stretches after emerging from her winter den. Females spend the winter on their own or with their cubs. They can survive in relative warmth, thanks to the properties of one form of frozen water, snow. Snow traps air and insulates the den, keeping the bear's body heat inside. If the female is pregnant, then she will also have her cubs in the den and keep them hidden below the snow for their own protection. Male polar bears don't dig dens. It's believed that they wander the ice throughout the long, dark winter. There is plenty of water in the Arctic, but because most of it is frozen water, the region is as inhospitable as a desert. In fact, the polar ice caps are deserts, some of the coldest deserts in the world. Another snowbound region holds a warm secret, flowing water that carries heat from deep underground. In North America's Yellowstone Park, eerie mists rise through the forest, even in midwinter. Hot volcanic springs create a spa in the snow. Bison can survive very low temperatures, but many of them seek out the hot springs to thaw out and enjoy a respite from winter. This natural sauna creates an oasis of warmth. Even scavenging coyotes take time off to enjoy it. Some animals need the warmth to survive, but Yellowstone's otters are perfectly insulated against the cold. They certainly know how to make the most of their frozen world.
Winter is even the time to mate. If a new litter is started now, the pups will not be born until the weather is much warmer. The waters of Yellowstone, a mix of freezing rivers and hot springs, support a broad range of wildlife. Some of its animal residents could never survive the brutal winter without the presence of the superheated water. In Yellowstone's hottest springs, water as hot as 100 degrees bubbles to the surface. This looks like an unlikely place to find any life at all. Springs much like these were possibly one of the very first waters of life, where primitive bacteria were born. Mats of simple organisms actually thrive in scalding springs. In places like Yellowstone and Iceland, water blasts from geysers in its third form, water vapour. In this case, hot water vapour, steam. In all of its forms, water is the very essence of life on Earth. The complex chemistry of life can take place only in a solution of liquid water. As a liquid, as ice and even as steam, Water supports a huge range of diverse species, from microscopic bacteria to blue whales. Some geothermal springs remain at a balmy temperature all year round. In the Florida springs, water bubbling up from underground is a constant 22 degrees. Limestone has soaked up millions of gallons of rain, like a sponge. Where the pressure is high enough, the water is forced back out. Fish bask in the warm springs. This is a strange world few of us ever see. Hidden at the bottom of these pools is their source, the fresh water that percolates up through the limestone layers. Needlefish feed near the surface, mostly on the fry of other fish. They are not alone. Because these waters are always balmy and rich in minerals, hundreds of different species thrive here. Mullet are vegetarians, who could even be described as farmers. They graze on the algae that coat the seagrass and will even tend their crop guarding a patch in order to maintain a healthy supply of food for themselves. As in every environment, where there is prey, there are predators. Cormorants living in these springs have the same problem as the otters in Lake Tanganyika. In clear water, their prey can see them coming. So the birds hunt in groups, trying to flush the fish from the grass. Thank you. 
cormorants are expert divers. Their feet are positioned at the very rear of their bodies to provide maximum thrust. Even so, hunting is difficult, and they're not always successful. After feeding, the birds dry themselves in the sun. During the winter, the warm water of the springs attracts migrants. Manatees come from the Gulf of Mexico to bask in the shallows. Although they spend much of their time in the ocean, they can also survive in fresh water. These gentle creatures are strict vegetarians, yet they grow up to three meters long. Unfortunately, manatees can be at great risk in fresh water. They move slowly, so they cannot easily get out of the path of motorboats. Many manatees bear scars caused by propeller blades. Fresh water comes in many forms. It may be fresh, but it's not new. Water has been endlessly recycled in an ancient process. From salty seawater to water vapor to rain across the ages. The Florida springs contain ancient underground water and they support one species that's nearly as old as the water itself. Alligators, virtually unchanged from their prehistoric ancestors. They use water to help them communicate, generating a remarkable soundtrack that only they can create. This is a strange world. The waters themselves dance to subsonic bellows. This display quickly establishes which alligators are the strongest. The resulting hierarchy will be in place for months. It prevents potentially deadly fighting between these enormous reptiles. Water supports all life on Earth. It cycles through time, evaporating and re-falling as rain again and again. The water molecules that fall on alligators living in North America today may have fallen on dinosaurs living in Asia long, long ago. There is no telling where the moisture stored in the clouds will be used next, or by whom, but wherever it falls, it will remain part of an endless cycle supporting an infinite equation, life itself.